So just in the introduction, uh, they say, uh, in the most recent Centers for Disease Control and Prevention analysis of available national data among individuals diagnosed with COVID-19, a 35-year-old with diabetes mellitus, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, obesity, or other chronic conditions had a similar risk of COVID-19-related hospitalization, I was a 35-year-old with one of the comorbidities, as a 75-year-old with none of these conditions, and a similar risk of COVID-19-related death as a 65-year-old with none of these conditions, a dramatic biologic aging effect of poor metabolic health on risk of severity of a viral infection such as COVID-19. So that is a pre-existing um, piece of research from the CDC that this paper is um, citing. And then um, here is, um, this is just the paper. It's in the Journal of the American Heart Association. O'Hearn et al. just published. And I'm just going to read their set-aside box here, clinical perspective. What is new? Meaning, what is new in this paper? Patients with cardiometabolic conditions, in particular obesity, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and heart failure, have a high risk of poor outcomes from coronavirus disease 2019 infection. That's actually not new. We already knew that. Those are some of the major comorbidities for COVID-19 for bad outcomes uh, and for actually getting the disease at all. Among, among more than 900,000 U.S. coronavirus disease 2019 hospitalizations through November 18th, 2020, nearly two-thirds... 63.5% were estimated to be attributable to these cardiometabolic conditions, that is, preventable if these conditions had not been present. Top risks were obesity, uh, which is explaining 30% of that um, nearly two-thirds, hypertension at 26%, diabetes mellitus at 21%, um, and then heart disease was, I think, about 12 or so. Um, and then what are the clinical implications? Clinicians should educate their patients who may be at risk and consider promoting preventative lifestyle measures, such as improved dietary quality and physical activity to improve overall cardiometabolic health and potentially minimize the risk for coronavirus disease 2019 severity. At some level, again, assuming that they have done this, you know, sort of like massive data review and analysis accurately, which includes lots of places where there are models, so you know, lots of places for it not to have been done brilliantly. Um, at some level, I feel like finally, finally, someone is doing this kind of work and talking directly about um, about actually what makes you as an individual more likely to have a bad outcome among those factors that you actually potentially have control over. You know, there has been a lot of talk about age, and it's true, right? The older you are, the more at risk you are of getting and of, of having a poor outcome from the disease, but you can't do anything about that. We don't, we don't have the solution to that yet. Sex, uh, men are more likely to both get slightly and have bad outcomes more so. Um, COVID-19 than women, and then race. And actually, um, to some degree, uh, Black people, but really um, Latina, what, what, are, what is often described as Hispanic people, um, have um, m much worse outcomes compared to their, um, you know, many more Hispanics are affected than you would expect from background rates of Hispanics in the population. So those are those are all true things about which you can't do anything, right? You can't just Frankly, you can't just declare yourself a different age or a different sex or a different race, right? But these comorbidities, you potentially can. Not all of them, and not if you're really, you know, really <clears throat> far gone. But if you start to eat better and be more active in your life, you can reduce um, your obesity and your hypertension and potentially deal with your diabetes mellitus. All of these are at least affected by, and in some cases, majorly affected by lifestyle choices. So I, of course, fully agree with that. And there is an obvious discussion to be had about the absurdities of this moment and the idea that to discuss such things is to pretend that a particular body form is more healthy when, in fact, of course, a yes. particular body form is more healthy. Now I'm fat shaming. Um, right. You, you could yeah. be dismissed as fat shaming. And mm -hmm. to the extent that the data seem to reflect that this is not fat shaming, this is just analysis, then we can also complain that data, the very idea of data, logic, science is white supremacist, whatever it is. And so obviously... <laughs> The right analysis is no, none of that is true, mm -hmm. right? That is not to say science hasn't been put to bad ends or bent to particular populations' uh, desires or needs or whatever. Of course it has. But 
the point is those tools are actually indifferent to who you are if you use them right. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing though I want to point out is that there's a whole set of analyses that one wants. In effect, there are going to be dozens of factors involved in how likely you are to contract COVID-19 and what happens to you after you do, mm -hmm. right? Type O blood appears to be involved. It seems to be somewhat protective as compared to type A. So we talked about that in like our first or second live stream, and I haven't seen anything about that for many months now. Have you seen anything? Up yes, to date? I did just see something okay. recent, but I don't have it. Uh, maybe, okay. maybe, but that we'll seems to be holding. It. It seems to be holding. Okay. Um, but here's here's the point. Type O blood is not going to be independent of all these other factors. So. Right. Does the fact that uh, black people and Hispanic people are facing more COVID, does that hold if we control for vitamin D? Probably, because the comparison between blacks and Hispanics likely involves blacks making less vitamin D as a result of just being on average darker. Or if we control for obesity and hypertension rates. Right. And so that's what you really want to do is yeah. figure out how many of these things are correlated indirectly through something else, right? Mm -hmm. Through through cultural factors, right? How many people live in a household can have effects. Um, uh, you know, it could be genetic factors, but indirect like melanin production and its interface with vitamin D production. One of the things we talked about earlier, a paper you brought to the discussion was um, the the local subway lines that people were forced to take. More People were more likely to be forced to take to get to work if they lived in low-income areas in New York City. This was a New York City-based subway analysis. Right, which was a yep. beautiful case yep. of something that had nothing to do inherently with biology, but was having impacts on biology mm -hmm. by virtue of the way the city is constructed. Right. Um, the, the, the neighborhoods in the city were effectively segregated by ethnicity. And so people of certain ethnicities were at more risk of getting the thing because they happened to live in places and were taking these subway lines where they were stuck in these tiny cars with lots of people getting on and off all the time for longer. Yep. Yep. So um, anyway, one wants the analysis of variants that picks apart all of the factors, figures out which ones are actually directly correlated and which yeah. ones evaporate when you control for their connection to other things. Um, and then you would be maximally armed. And so in some sense, we all carry around this, you know, this stuff from the beginning, which is very probably true. In fact, it's hard to imagine how it's false that age is this dominant factor. But the point is, okay, if in effect obesity causes you to behave like somebody who's much older, right, with respect mm. to contracting COVID-19, then the point is, well, you don't have control over the age, but you might have control over the obesity, right? Mm -hmm. And so thinking in these terms, like, okay, we all probably have a few tick marks against us with respect to COVID-19. And then we have some other places where, you know, we may have uh, the opportunity to do something. And the question is, well, how low can you get your risk? And, you know, if you can't get your risk metabolically low, maybe you need to c correct for it behaviorally, right? Mm -hmm. So the point is armed with information, you are in the best position to manage this, which also means stopping the focus on death, which is, yes. of course, you know, death is very important. But mm -hmm. from the point of view yes. of, of actually you may get over this thing, but it may rob you of a decade of life by virtue of what it's done to your lungs or your circulatory tissue. That's a very important factor. And um, anyway, the only right answer here is for us to figure out how to do these analyses so they're not polluted, so that our information and therefore our models, both formal and informal, get better over time, which then arms us maximally to protect ourselves and to, you know, to to uh, to choose our future, you know, collectively. Like, mm -hmm. at what point do we, um, you know, say, well, this is under control enough that we have to prioritize the world moving forward? Right. That's a discussion yeah. we can only have if we have really good information on where we are and what our actual risks are. Yes. No, that's right. And um, you know, unfortunately, all of the new variants are making that conversation even harder to have um, because, oh, you know, we we might have expected, and in fact, I think we predicted early on um, that um, this was, you know, th this this is likely to become less virulent over time. It's effectively, I, and, I, and I have seen a number of other scientists propose, that this is likely to become just a circulating background disease that effectively children get exposed to um, and thus have some immunity to going forward. Um, I don't know 
and I've seen no one attempt an analysis of what these <clears throat> different variants um, that are wildly different in terms of both transmissibility and death rate might do to that analysis. Right. Like, or even like how we proceed with analysis in the light of those, really. And, you know, I mean, we've got two novel factors here. One, the ultimate wild card. If this isn't a natural virus, if this is a modified virus, then it will not abide by our expectations uh, evolutionarily that are based on what wild viruses do when they jump. Right. Um, now, it's also quite possible that it would be novel in its own right. Having jumped from nature with no human tinkering, maybe this is just going to follow a different pattern and we're going to learn something about viruses we didn't know. Mm -hmm. But if it's uh, modified, if it is enhanced, then one expects a very um, different pattern to emerge yes. from this. The other thing is that these vaccines are, it is increasingly clear to me that these vaccines are novel, not only with respect to the frightening interaction that they have with systems where we can't predict what the long-term impact is going to be because we haven't seen it yet. And You're because talking specifically about the mRNA vaccines or also about the DNA vaccines. So just to, so, and we've talked a lot about vaccines on the show before, but we've got uh, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, Pfizer, and, Pfizer and BioNTech and Moderna vaccines, those two, uh, which are widespread in the U.S. at this point, which are both mRNA vaccines. And you've got the AstraZeneca slash Oxford vaccine, which it looks like is not going to be available in the U.S., but is available a few other places. And Johnson & Johnson, which may be about to get FDA approval in the U.S. Both of those, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, are DNA vaccines, also not traditional, but they use a delivery mechanism of an adenovirus um, rather than these lipid nanoparticles. Yep, and I see in you know various comments that we get uh, in various places, we're having trouble conveying uh, the evolutionary uh, approach here. So to the extent that the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines are not um, a tried and true technology, they're somewhat more tried and true than the lipid nanoparticles that are used for the mRNA vaccines. One part of them is tried and true, right? One part of them is more traditional vaccine-wise, but mm -hmm. what it also is, is something that we have evolutionary experience with that has nothing to do with vaccines. That is to say, experience with adenoviruses, right? So that experience with adenoviruses that our ancestors and probably each of us has yes. had yeah. actually makes this safer as well. Um, but in any case, the so when I'm talking about the novel factor of the vaccines, I'm actually talking about, so we've really got two categories. We've got mm -hmm. the mRNA vaccines and their lipid nanoparticles and the adenovirus vaccines DNA vaccines and their adenoviruses, just to be very careful right. about mRNA yes. with lipid nanoparticles, DNA with adenoviruses. Right. So the adenovirus vaccines are carrying their information in the form of DNA, which then gets translated into RNA, which then creates spike protein, which then alerts the immune system exactly as the uh, mRNA vaccines do. Yep. But there is another unique factor here, which has nothing to do with the delivery mechanism at all. In which? In both, in okay. all four of these yep. uh, vaccines, the two different categories for vaccines. And that is that we are very narrowly targeting the spike protein. And by very narrowly targeting the spike protein, we are creating a uh, an evolutionary, a concentrated evolutionary force, whereas cruder, more primitive vaccine technologies that, you know, take a, a, a whole virus and either break it up or uh, neutralize its pathogenic effect, those things are much more general. And so the compare... So but be, be more precise about that. But when you say they're much more general, you're basically, you're giving your body an attenuated or you know pieces of the original virus, and your body can then develop an ability to recognize lots of different parts of that. Whereas the four vaccines that we named, the two mRNA and the two DNA vaccines, only provide the body with an ability to recognize the spike protein, which means that if the spike protein is to change, just to, to list one possible problem with this, if the spike protein is to evolve, then um, all, of the, all of these four vaccines um, are rendered useless. Not useless, yeah. uh, less useful. Less useful. But it does two things. I mean, this is the thing. We're in if this weren't so politicized, this would be incredibly fascinating. So yeah. politicized and so dangerous. This would be fascinating because what we're doing 
is experimenting with a much more targeted vaccine, right? Narrowly targeted. That narrowly targeted vaccine increases the likelihood of our vaccines becoming more useless over time because we're creating a very uh, precise attack that the virus will be favored to resist. However, it also creates the possibility of effectively swapping out the information in these vaccines without going through the rest of it. Which is part of why, at least, I mean, I, I know much less about the DNA vaccine development, but the mRNA vaccine development um, has the potential to be so fast. And indeed, apparently, one of them, I don't remember which, was actually created in a weekend back in like February or March of last year. And, you know, if they turn out to be as safe and effective as the whole world is hoping that they are, um, then this really does mean that future pandemics could be halted pretty quickly with, you know, widespread inoculation by uh, new, you know, rapidly developed mRNA vaccines. Potentially. Now, what you really want to know is how much of the variance in the risk that comes with these things is due to the delivery mechanism and how much is due to the uh, the informational content, whether it's in mRNA or DNA. DNA. Yeah. Because if the danger is in the informational content, then you can't uh, make the safety process ra- more rapid, mm-hmm. right? You have to go through it. Right. On the other hand, right. if the danger is really in the delivery mechanism, then A, maybe we can refine that, right? We can reduce the danger and still get the delivery. And then B, swap out the information, and you could even imagine a future not so far down the road where you might not have to have centralized creation of these things. You could have, you know, effectively like printing newspapers in each town, right? You could have a factory. 3D printing for vaccines. The equivalent, Mm -hmm. right? You could have that sort of thing taking place so that as the thing, as we got really good at tracking Uh, pathogens and epidemics, we would also get really good at delivering, you know, it could be targeted in the sense that your vaccine could be built for the particular strains that are circulating in your municipality. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, there's lots of possibilities here. Um, But boy, what a dangerous experiment we're discovering this stuff in. 